When I was growing up near Cleveland, Ohio, an amazing thing happened. The Cuyahoga River caught on fire. We had put so much gas and oil and heavy metal pollution into the river that when a small barge caught on fire, it caught the whole river on fire. That experience undoubtedly started me on my lifetime passion and desire to understand our water resources, our lakes, our rivers, our streams, our oceans. That desire has led me to some amazing places, to New Zealand, to Central America, to South America, to China, and now to South Florida. The vi one of the most vibrant international cities in the world. From the iconic South Beach to the east, to Miami, to the west, and a little further west to all the ethnic neighborhoods that make this place such a great place to live, so diverse. And then, just 25 miles to the west, we get to the world's largest and most important freshwater wetland, the Everglades. Home of the Miccosukee Indians, home of the Florida Panther, home of so many organisms wholly dependent on this ecosystem and only found there. But in this idyllic setting, from the glitz and glamour of South Beach to the serenity and awesome beauty of the Everglades, we have some issues, some really big issues. We have an ever-expanding human population, both locally and globally. We have a climate that's changing rapidly before our eyes. And of course, we have sea level rise. The data for this are clear. This science is clear. This is a graph that shows carbon dioxide temperature and sea level rise through time. Look at the green line, carbon dioxide, goes up and down, up and down. Then look at the red line, goes up and down, up and down. See the pattern? When carbon dioxide goes up, temperature goes up. And then look at the blue line, sea level rise, goes up and down. See the pattern? When carbon dioxide goes up, temperature goes up, sea level goes up. That pattern is clear. It's repeated itself for millennia. But look in the red box. Look at the green line. We have reached a point at 7.5 billion people that carbon dioxide is a, is a density in our atmosphere higher than we have ever seen. And the really bad news is it's increasing faster than we ever thought possible. The data are clear. The science is clear. This is South Florida today. This is an elevational map. The green is low elevation, and then yellow and red are higher elevations. No wonder they call us ground zero. When the highest point in your landscape is a landfill, you're vertically challenged. <laughs> what I'm going to show you <coughs> is a visualization put together by my friend and colleague Pete Harlem at Florida International University using the very best data, the very best available models, this allows us to see where we are and where we're going as we continue to emit carbon dioxide, as temperature continues to increase, as the ice melts and the seas rise. This is a really particularly telling slide. This is what South Florida will look like at five feet of sea level rise. That will occur when the Earth's temperature has risen by 0.8 degrees Celsius. We reached that this year. This is what we know. The data are clear. This is what we face in the future. We're not sure if that's in 85 years or 100 years or 120 years. We're collecting those data now. And in the next 10 to 20 years, we'll have much better refined projections to actually say when this will happen and how fast it'll happen. But it's clear this is what's going to happen. It's happened before. It happened 120,000 years ago. There was nobody there to care. Okay, as we continue to emit carbon dioxide, as we continue to raise the Earth's temperature, as the ice continues to melt, as the seas continue to expand, they continue to rise. South Florida will look very different. The smart investor will start buying land at the I-75 corridor. You'll have beachfront, beachfront property. But we have a bigger problem that's gonna hit us faster 
that we have to solve sooner, even prior to the seas inundating our cities, the salt waters affecting our infrastructure. South Florida is built on old coral reefs, porous limestone. For those of you who've walked along the beach, you pick up um, coral, you, you're, you're, you're fascinated by how light it is, you can see through it. Well, that porosity allows water to move in and out pretty easily. So now we've got this issue. We've got this porous limestone that we're standing on, literally right now, underneath our feet, and we've got the seas rising. More salt water coming over the top, seas rising, higher pressure pushing along the sides. So salt water is starting to move into our fresh water. And the second problem is, we're just now beginning to understand the intricate relationship between the Florida Everglades, 25 miles to the west, and our coastal resilience and where most of the people are all the way in the coast. This is what the Everglades once looked like. A large expanse of fresh water, Okeechobee, Lake Okeechobee in the north, big sheets of water flowing from north to south into Florida Bay. This is what it looks like today. Half of its original side. We made a choice as Florida expanded, as Miami grew, that we were going to drain the so-called swamp. We we're going to drain it to provide more agricultural land, to provide more land for buildings. We didn't know that, that the Florida Everglades were responsible for our fresh water, for the drinking water, for the water that we depend on for agriculture. We didn't know. And we definitely, <coughs> sorry, we definitely didn't know that the seas were rising. So now we've got a serious problem. We've got the Everglades that have shrunk and the seas that are rising. We have a pressure problem. The salt water is pushing harder than the fresh water and the fr salt water is starting to move into our drinking water. That's an issue that's gonna come far faster than the seas coming over, the, over onto land. We often hear this is a too complicated of a problem. It's too big. It's global. We've never seen anything like this. I don't know what to do. So let's think about that. It's too complicated. The data aren't complicated. The science isn't complicated. It's clear. CO2 causes temperature to rise, causes ice to melt, causes seas to rise. That's not, not complicated. There's a little bit of uncertainty about how fast this is going to happen, how fast the seas will rise and when that will happen. We're collecting really good data. In the next 10 to 20 years, we'll have much better predictions about how that's going to happen. There'll be much less uncertainty about that. There is some complication. We have a global economy fueled, no pun intended, on burning fossil fuels. That continues to emit carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. That is complicated. We've never faced anything like this before. Meet my sons, Andy and Ben. <coughs> in, 19, in the late 1980s, we had the great opportunity of living in New Zealand, where every morning we watched the weather channel, not to see if it was gonna rain or snow or what the temperature was gonna be, but to see what the burn time was. How long my kids could be out in the New Zealand stream helping me sample before they got severe sunburn. We had a global problem. We were emitting chlorofluorocarbons as part of our refrigeration and cooling um, manufacturing, which was getting into the atmosphere and interacting with something called ozone. Ozone is like sunscreen for the Earth. It blocks out the, the harmful solar radiation. And these CFCs were moving into the atmosphere, interacting with the ozone and creating holes, which was allowing harmful solar radiation to hit the Earth's surface, which was hitting human beings, causing severe sunburn, causing skin cancer, and ultimately causing deaths associated with skin cancer. So what happened? You don't hear about the ozone holes anymore. You don't hear about a problem of ozone. The world came together and had a conversation. And the conversation went something like this. We have a problem. We have human health and welfare at risk. Here's the problem. We're, we're emitting CFCs into the atmosphere. They're messing up the atmosphere. They're reacting with ozone, and it's changing our thermal balance. Bad, bad rays are hitting the earth, causing the problem. 
Let's get together and think about this. The global leaders got together and they said, what's the solution? The solution is to ban CFCs. Let's find an alternative. They did. They were ammonia-based particles that would help us with our refrigeration and stuff. They found a solution and they basically fixed the problem. You don't hear about ozone anymore. It's now time for us to have a very similar conversation. It's kind of similar. We have a problem. Human health and well-being is, is in jeopardy. What's the problem? Carbon dioxide is getting into the atmosphere. It's causing the temperatures to rise, the ice to melt, the seas to rise. We need to have a conversation about what to do next. The Pope has already joined in this conversation. The Pope has asked us to look inside and, and ask the moral and ethical question, what do we owe to the rest of civilization? What do we owe to the small island nations like Haiti or places in the South Pacific that don't have the resources to grow taller or move farther? What do we owe morally and ethically to the Inuits in Alaska whose entire culture and livelihood are based on a cultural existence with ice sheets, hunting, fishing? Don't we owe something ethically and morally to those folks? We need to come to a, a, a point where we take responsibility for the next generation as well as everyone else. We're about to have one of the most important global conversations that will have a huge impact on our history in one month. December 2015, one month from now, our global leaders are going to go to Paris, France for a climate summit and they're going to have a conversation they know what the problem is. They know what the data look like. Now the conversation is, what do we do? Where do we cap temperature rise? At what point are we going to say, that's it, no more? No more carbon dioxide, no more increase in temperature. Right now the discussion is somewhere between 1.5 degrees and 2 degrees. Well, you saw what it looks like. 2 degrees is probably not so good if you live in a coastal area. South Florida will look far differently. 1.5, we have some optimism, we have some, a chance. We have to have that conversation. The author Kubler-Ross introduced the stages of grief, um, uh, 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 the five stages of grief, denial, anger, depression, bargaining, and acceptance. Dr. Steve Running applied those to climate. He said, you know, that kind of explains the stages that people have when we talk about climate change and all of those things those same five stages. So we now have to get to the stage of acceptance. We have to accept the science and data in front of us. We have to use that to our advantage. We have to accept the challenge that carbon dioxide is the problem. We have to find alternatives, better solar power, better um, even safer nuclear power, more wind power. Some of the leading companies are now accepting that challenge. Groups like GE, Walmart, Tesla, they're putting in large re amounts of resources to look for new alternative sources of energy, things that aren't carbon-based, things that don't con continue to emit carbon dioxide. We need oil companies to rename themselves energy companies and put the same amount of resources and ingenuity that they did into alternative sources of energy that they did when we looked into deep sea oil exploration. They went far and fast. That's the kind of thing we need. We re reached the level of acceptance in South Florida over a decade ago. Sea level rise kind of hit us in the face. What are we going to do about our freshwater drinking problem? What are we going to do about that? We've already started one of the world's largest restoration efforts. We're going to put the flows back into the Everglades so that they go north to south with more clean water to fill the Everglades, fill, back, fill up our aquifers. We're going to use fresh water to push back salt water to protect our drinking water. We're already doing it and we're going to continue to do it. It's going to take time and it's going to cost money, but the alternatives are far, far worse. South Florida has reached this level of acceptance to an amazing way. We have the three southeast uh, counties in Florida forming a very unique southeast regional climate compact. Municipalities, cities, counties coming together saying, we're all in this together, folks. Let's pool our resources, let's pool our knowledge, and let's figure out where we're going from here. 
The universities across the state of Florida have come together to create the Florida Climate Institute to bring our best minds, our best data, our best thinking to bear on this problem so that we have the best data in front of us to solve the issue. Here at FIU, Florida International University, we've launched the Sea Level Solution Center. We've brought the best talent we have across this campus from engineers, environmental sciences, architects, to bring together the best data, the best technology, to work with our partner cities, our, our counties and our municipalities and say, here, we'll give you the best information we have. Let's use it, let's solve the issue. My generation brought us the data and the science needed to face the problem, to get the world to acceptance. It's now incumbent on my son's generation to take us one step farther, to refine those alternative sources of energy, solar, wind, nuclear, to get us off a carbon-based global economy, to make smart decisions. This is my grandson, Theo. I, I feel a lot of responsibility to him. I want him to sit on the same beaches with his grandson that he and I do. But I also feel a huge amount of hope because his generation is not only going to not emit carbon, they're, not, they're going to be using alternative fuels, some of which we might not have even thought of, but they will refine things like carbon scrubbers. They're going to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, not put it in, and they're going to remove it faster than the Earth would heal itself. They're going to reverse those trends that we saw that clearly are the cause and effect of the issues we have ahead of us. So I want to add one more level to climate grief. I want to add the level of climate resolve. Let's resolve to use the best science and data we have ahead of us to come up with the best and smartest solutions in the short term. We're going to get through this next hundred years. But then let's also have the resolve to look farther, to think about how we're going to reverse the trends. We can't let it happen naturally. My parents taught me a lot of things, but one thing they taught me was, <clears throat> If something is worth fighting for, you might as well win. And that's what we're going to do. For those of you who are still stuck in the phase of, of climate depression, I get it. Some days I get up and I feel a little bit depressed. But I assure you that our last chapter has not yet been written. Thank you.